person of Christ. Most heresy centers about what we think about Jesus. Most false teaching, what we think about Jesus. And there were two errors. First of all, the real humanity of Jesus. What was coming into the church in those days was a denial that Jesus was a real human being. He only looked like one. Because they were getting what they called a Gnostic heresy. And what they said is all flesh is sinful. All spirit is pure. So you could never have the two combined in one person. So if Jesus was the pure, holy, were eternal word, he could not have a real human body because all flesh is evil. So they said he only looked like a human being. John says, he who denies that Jesus has come in the flesh is an antichrist. He's not from God. So any teaching that says Jesus wasn't a real human being is a heresy. But the opposite side is also true, is the real deity of Jesus Christ. So another uh, heresy was he was a real human being, but he wasn't always God. He became God at the resurrection. That's one well, amazing thing going around. Uh, years ago, I brought a team from the Assemblies of God Bible School in England, where I was teaching, out on a mission trip to Malaysia. And one of the girls, she was actually a Malaysian Chinese, but she was studying in the UK. And uh, uh, we sent them all out on personal evangelism. She came back and she said, oh, I've just had a, a wonderful talk to some Muslims about Jesus. But they challenged me and said, oh, you believe in three gods, don't you? Mother God, Father God, and, and Jesus God. Yeah. They got mixed. You know, some, some uh, Muslims believe that's what we teach. Mary's God, the Father's God, and Jesus is God. They get confused. Like a when I was a young Christian, I used to wear a Jesus Saves badge. I was on a train once going for a job interview, and this, uh, this Pakistani man said, Oh, you're a Christian? I said, Yeah. He said, Oh, so you believe that Miriam ate the apple and got pregnant? And he got confused with the Garden of Eden eating the forbidden fruit and Mary getting pregnant by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I said, I said That's not what we believe. Oh, I know what you Christians believe. You believe that Miriam ate the apple and got pregnant. I said, no, no, we don't believe that. He said, I know what you believe. <laughs> so trying to convince the guy. Um, and, you know, so the wrong concept. So this girl came to me. And she, she said, they challenged me about the Trinity. So I, she said, I put it like this. When he was in heaven, he was called a father. And when he was on earth, he was called Jesus. And now he's called the Holy Spirit. I said, that is not the Trinity. That's what is known as modalism. The Trinity is one God, three persons all alive and existing at the same time. You know, just a little digression. That's why I believe that God is love. Because love must always have an object to love. So if, if Jesus had not been eternal, always with the Father, the Father had no one to love, and therefore he could not be love. He has always been love because he always had the Son to love. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so this false teaching, number one, he wasn't a real man. Number two, he wasn't really God. And the, the creedal statement is very man of very man, very God of very God. Amen. In other words, he was totally man. He was totally God all at the same time. That's the biblical teaching. That's the Jesus we serve. And I'm glad about that. Amen. Because if he was only a man, he couldn't help me. If he was only God, he wouldn't know how I feel. But because he's been a man and is also God, he knows exactly how I feel, and he's got the power to help me. Amen? Amen. Okay, just a couple more things, then we're going to take a five-minute break, because I think some of you look like you need to use potty, or slap yourself, or throw water <laughs> in your face, or something like that. And so, we'll, we'll just uh, conclude. So that's the content of the heresy. It is the person of Christ. The second thing is the practice of Christians. Is it okay to worship idols? My answer is definitely not. Amen? And Paul says that even food offered to idols, he said, if you don't know it's been offered, don't ask. That's basically what he says in 1 Corinthians. But if someone comes and says to you, this has been offered to my God, you don't take it for the sake of their conscience. I remember a friend of mine years ago, actually he was pastoring Kota Baru, Richard, Richard Tong, do you? You probably don't even remember him. You're too young. And he said, when he became a Christian, he was the only Christian in his family. And it came around a Chinese New Year, and he thought, I'm in trouble here. Because his grandmother was very religious. So he went along, you know, to the family reunion, and he's watching, and every 
plate she brings and she puts it before the altar and she offers it and puts it on the table and he's thinking, oh no, Lord, oh Lord. And then he noticed that by mistake, she walked out of the kitchen with a bowl of soup and bypassed the altar and put it on the table. So I thought, thank you, Jesus. So he got the soup and then she said, the pork is very nice. Oh no, but the soup is good. And all night long, the only thing he ate was soup because he knew it had not been offered to the idol and he wouldn't have to answer any questions. They kept saying, no, the chicken very good. No, no, the soup's fine. Thank you. So he survived so on soup. Uh, so that was his way of dealing with it. I don't know whether that was right or not. But anyway, uh, we know because it's a reality here in Malaysia, isn't it? Yes? And Paul is very clear. If they tell you, you don't take it. If they don't tell you, don't ask. You certainly do not take a picture of yourself eating bakute and post it on the internet saying, Slam up, book a puasa. Ah, did you see that? Those idiots. By the way, one was called Alvin Tan. Do you know Pastor Alvin Tan? There's a pastor called Alvin Tan. I'm going to write to him and say, I did not know that you were posting stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. No. Uh, you know, in a, in a multi religious society, we are gracious to one another, aren't we? Yes? I will, I will go to someone's open house. Praise God. I will go to my Malay neighbor's open house. Hari Raya. Fine. Because they know what we stand for. We do not insult each other, but we don't give the impression that we will go along with anything that is against our faith in Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. Um, there's a compromise in religion taking place right now. There are groups in America, do you know, and they, they are trying to combine Islam and Christianity. Serious. They're calling it Chrislam. <laughs> Serious. You, you, you're laughing. That is absolutely true. There are churches now called Chrislam churches. You can't combine. That's oil and water, friends. Because the creedal statement in Islam is, Allah was not begotten, neither does he beget. In other words, he does not have a son. We believe Jesus is the Son of God. Amen? Amen. Jesus is the Son of God. And so that's where, you know, we have to stand and be faithful. And so this is a compromise taking place. The practice of Christians. Um, idolatry and immorality. It's okay to have sex. Even inside the church with someone who's not your wife. And it went on, it developed later on that that was part of their, their worship. Just a, there are some Hindu temples you can go to in India where, you know, there are temple prostitutes. And it's part of the worship. But that's not part of Christianity. Part of Christianity is being pure. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the person who can rise, go to the end of his life and say, the only person I ever had relations with was my wife. That person is a wise person. Amen? Now, if you had it before you were saved, well, that's forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Okay. Now, how to conquer the heresy. That's the contents of it. Test the Spirit. Shall I tell you how? This word. That's the best test. Yes? That's the best test. If anyone comes and preaches something and you say, uh, uh, but I know a Bible verse that says the very opposite of that, like this guy saying, we don't have to keep any of the commandments of Jesus. Now he's died and been resurrected and that Jesus says, after the resurrection, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Then I know who I'd rather believe. I'd rather believe Jesus. Yes? Uh, again, just, just to illustrate that, a friend of mine, a very close friend here in Malaysia, we've worked together, we've shared hotel rooms together, but he posted on uh, his Facebook last year, he said, if we preach obedience more than we preach grace, we are not preaching it like the Apostle Paul preached it. So what I did, day after day, I put the imperatives of Paul, the apostle of grace. And I went through all of Paul's letters where he gave commandments. And I conclude at the end, Paul used commandments in four times as many verses as he talked about grace. Amen? So I said, so anyone who tells you that if you preach commandments more than grace is not preaching like Paul, I say, they are the ones who are not preaching like Paul. Because Paul believed in being saved by grace, but four times more he gave commandments. So test the Spirit by the Word of God. 
You can only do that if you know the Word of God. Sad thing is, so many Christians really don't know their Bible very well. Let's get to know the Word. Then, of course, there are other tests, like there's such a gift as the discerning of spirits. It's one of the nine spiritual gifts mentioned by the Apostle Paul. And it works like this. You're sitting there, and the preacher says something, and you think, that doesn't feel right to me. You can't tell exactly why, but later on you know why. Amen? Like my wife has this, this gift to the nth degree. She'll say, that guy, something wrong with him. And I say, you can't say that. She says, yes, I can. Amen? Six months later, I'll discover the guy's wrong. He's bent. He's twisted. There's something wrong. I say, how did she know that? Because she knows that she knows that she knows that she knows. I went to preach in a church in, in uh, Kentucky, in America. And the pastor said a strange thing to me afterwards. His wife was called Gaynell. And after I preached the first service, he came to me afterwards and he said, Gaynell says you're okay, so you're coming back again. I said, huh? He said, I never allow anyone in my pulpit a second time if my wife feels there's something wrong. He said, and she's protected me from so many strange teachings and strange ideas and strange manifestations. And all the wives are nodding. Have you noticed this? All the wives are saying, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Why doesn't he listen to me when I say it? Yes? Amen. Okay. Test the spirits. Be indwelt by Christ. Amen. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. That's what John says. That's how to overcome. Make sure Jesus is living. Because I'll tell you what, when Jesus, who is the truth, is living in here, he will react against anything that's false. Teaching, practice, you, you, wow. Because he's living in me. And he's greater than any demonic spirit in the world that's trying to deceive me. So be indwelt by Christ. Repentance. To the churches that I accepted the Nicolaitans and I accepted Jezebel, to both of them, Jesus says, repent. So again, one famous preacher here in Southeast Asia says, there's no more need for repentance for Christians. Because all your past sins, all your present sins, and all your future sins are already forgiven. And then Jesus says, repent, repent. 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 I know who I'd rather believe. Amen? And repentance is more than just merely changing your mind. Repentance is changing your mind, and by changing your mind, changing your behavior. Hallelujah. Amen. So, repentance. And then, holding on to the truth. To the one church, he says, okay, I won't lay any other burden on you except hold on to what you've got. Amen? You've been taught the truth. Hold on to that truth. Can I just say, friends, I, I, I know your pastor pretty well by now. I know that you're getting a lot of good truth in this church. Is that right? Not many amens, brother. I'd watch out. Next vote of confidence, you're out, man. You don't do that in your church, do you? No, good. I'm glad. What a nonsense. What a nonsense. It's okay, we're having a private assembly conversation here. Some churches in, Amer in Malaysia you, you used to have to have a vote of confidence in the pastor at every annual general meeting. What a nonsense. It meant that he couldn't preach the truth for six months out of every year because he was scared of getting the sack. No, I know you're getting truth. Hold on to that truth, friends. That will protect you when all the weirdos come around with their strange teaching and their strange practices. And you say, no, that's not what I've been taught in my church. Praise God. I want to thank God, you know, when I was a young Christian 51 years ago, I got a very, 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 very good biblical foundation laid into me by my pastor. And it's kept me from many, many strange things over the years. Hold on to what you've got. Amen.